So here we are again in our lab to go through the dynamic adjustments of the neuroswing on the patient. Before we start to look at the dynamic alignment of this new orthosis while Henrik is walking, I would like to point out one thing. Please look at the functionality of the joint and note the spring units setup that was chosen to be observed during the dynamic adjustments. We should look at that and additionally, to check the functionality, we should make sure that the movement limitation screw that you can see here when you look through the top of the hex screw, there is a slotted screw, this screw should be turned all the way out, that means uh, turns upwards all the way as much as possible to achieve the full range of motion of the spring unit. In the following steps, we would like to select the correct spring unit. To be more precise, we want to determine the correct spring force, that is the required spring strength. Thus, it makes sense to do it without the limitation of the static stops in order to find out what the complete advantage of the neuroswing joint system is. It is very important that we take enough time for the functional evaluation for the dynamic adjustment of the neuroswing on the patient. We should also have considered which is the optimal alignment in advance. This means that we should always look at several step cycles before we take any measures to adjust the setting or change any of the spring units. For example, we should not make further changes to the static alignment of the orthosis because these adjustments were basically finished. All adjustments from now on should be made dynamically by observing the gate. Actually, this is the great advantage of the neuroswing ankle joint, that all the settings can be adjusted separately and are independent of each other. An example would be that we can provide more or less spring strength without having to change the static alignment. If the patient should feel insecure with the orthosis, it is of course acceptable and recommended that the patient chooses a suitable walking aid. In this case, forearm crutches. Then he is able to walk safely and to get used to the new orthosis. It is also very important to look at the walking speed of the patient. We will now see that Henrik walks at a relatively normal walking speed. A normal walking speed is about 5 km per hour. This is the optimal velocity to be able to differentiate the individual gait phases from each other, as described by Jacqueline Perry. It is also a good velocity to be able to draw the appropriate conclusions regarding the function and which may quickly indicate which changes are required in the settings of the neuroswing ankle joint. If the patient is faster than normal when walking, or if he or she is jogging or running, this could be an indication of an unsafe feeling with the orthosis. It does not necessarily have to be the case, but it could also be an indication of insecurity. In any case, it is clear that such a fast ambulation makes it difficult for us to distinguish the different gait phases, according to Perry, and to draw our own conclusions regarding the fine adjustments of the neuroswing ankle joint. It is exactly the same case when the patient is walking unusually slow. Slow means less than 2 km per hour, and if the patient is moving as slow as shown here, it is also difficult to differentiate the individual gait phases according to Perry and to draw conclusions about the functional changes that are now required in the neuroswing system ankle joint.
Ideally, we will have to look now at the online tutorials step by step to find out what we have to do next. The next working step is here. This step is related to the duration of the patient's step on each of the legs. That means we ask ourselves if the duration of the support on each of the legs is the same for both sides. If the patients bear the weight on the orthotic side just as long as on the contralateral side. If this is not the case, it could be an indication of an unsafe feeling or discomfort that the patient may be experiencing some pain perhaps, then the patient will noticeably reduce the amount of time spent on the orthotic side and pass the load to the contralateral side as quickly as possible. The next thing we would do once we have clarified these basic things about observing each of the steps, will be to take a look at the gait phases separately. We will analyze each of these phases individually to be able to draw some conclusions about the strength of the spring units that are required. While following Perry's description, of the phases of gait analysis, we should start with the initial heel contact. This means we look at our patient and observe if there is an initial contact with the heel. Yes, there is one. This is the result of our previously controlled and very thoroughly executed static alignment. We naturally have an initial contact and we could, in practice, continue with our procedure. If there is no ideal heel contact at initial contact and the patient possibly touches the ground with the forefoot first, Hendrik will show us what this looks like again. This would be an indication that the posterior spring is clearly too weak and is not able to hold the foot, or that the patient is actively compressing the posterior spring, possibly due to spasticity, and pushing the forefoot down, and as a result, they're stepping with the forefoot, steppage gait. At this point, we would have to differentiate whether it is an active action of the patient or not, and decide accordingly if the muscle tone should be reduced perhaps by building a functional heel lift or if it is simply due to the fact that the rear spring is not strong enough. In this case, we would have to change the spring for a stronger spring and that would take care of lifting the foot reliably. So much for the initial contact. The next gate phase is the loading response. This is the phase directly following the initial contact. So immediately after the heel touches the ground, the forefoot follows through a plantar flexion movement. So the full foot will also have contact with the ground. The loading response has a shock absorbing function after the initial contact and it should happen quickly or relatively fast to ensure that full contact of the foot with the floor quickly but in a relatively controlled manner so that the patients can make use of the complete support surface that is available to them. If we have, let's say, a spring that is too weak in the back. This loading response will be omitted, which means it will not occur in a controlled manner. There we would see the foot slap without control at loading response. This would be a signal for the orthotist to use a stronger spring unit in the back and then see 
What is the effect of more plantar flexion resistance in the patient's loading response? If the spring unit is too strong in the back, the loading response may not occur because the ankle will remain in a neutral position. And instead of a plantar flexion, an exaggerated flexion moment at the knee will be the outcome, which in turn will result in an unstable tibial progression going into the mid-stance phase. Okay, here we are then at the next gait phase, so to speak. Initial contact, loading response, and now mid-stance. We will look at what happens in the mid-stance phase, although actually we already looked at this in the static alignment. This is the position we were looking for statically. So we also check the knee angle in the mid-stance phase again in the dynamic alignment. The knee angle in the mid-stance phase is the same as the knee angle we selected previously in the static alignment on the patient. Ideally, this should be more or less 5 degrees. Yes, this would be the optimal position. So we also check if the patient's knee presents too much flexion already. Is the patient standing with too much knee flexion at mid-stance? Then he or she will basically enter into the late mid-stance with a flexed knee. And you might hear a loud impact sound on the front spring unit. Well, this is not so easy to demonstrate, but it is surely a hint that the front spring unit is too weak. So, after making the assessment of initial contact, loading response, and mid-stance, where we basically determined the strength of the rear spring, we now will evaluate the strength of the anterior spring unit, looking at the faces from mid-stance on. The example just shown is an example of a two-week spring anteriorly. In contrast, if the anterior spring unit is too strong, dorsiflexion in the late stance phase will be omitted. The late stance phase is practically skipped and terminal stance takes place too early. Terminal stance describes the moment when the heel is lifted off the ground. This effect can be seen when either the movement limitation screw is screwed in at the front or the anterior spring is too strong. So ideally, in the physiological sense, we would observe a dorsiflexion of about 5 degrees in the late mid-stance. And only at the moment when the load is transferred to the contralateral side and the terminal stance takes place, will the heel be lifted off the ground reliably? This is the moment of heel off. In the terminal stance, as I have already mentioned, the heel should come off the ground. However, if this is not the case and the heel stays on the ground for a very long time, then the terminal stance is basically skipped. That means from late stance, in which the dorsiflexion takes place, and up to the toe-off, there is no clear load transfer with a heel-to-toe gait, which indicates that the front spring is too weak. In particular, the choice of the front spring is a very fine balance. Gait must be carefully observed to obtain a good result. Enough time should be allowed for the patient to get used to the orthosis and gain some confidence to support the weight on the ventral shell. 
and thus be able to compress the anterior spring. Well, yes, if this compression happens too fast in the front spring, then the spring unit is definitely too weak. We will hear the front spring unit hit the static stop. And as I said before, if the front spring is too strong, there will be no compression of the front spring in the late mid-stance phase. Yeah, Henry can walk past us again and demonstrate what it looks like if the front spring unit is too strong. That means that the compression of the front spring unit is not realized. This not only affects the ankle angle, but also the knee angle, which will be too straight and in the worst case will result in hyperextension. So in this case, the front spring unit would have to be replaced by a weaker spring unit to improve the gait pattern and also to get closer to a physiological knee angle during the late mid stance and also terminal stance. Hmm. Yes, basically we are already at the end of the adjustments required for this ankle joint, or better said, at the end of the explanation regarding the correct selection of the strength of the spring units for the narrow swing. You can draw your own conclusions from it, and I think I will say goodbye and take this opportunity to mention the online tutorials, which can be found in our website.